Hello, and thank you all for joining us today. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you and your loved ones are healthy and safe. My name is Randy Bell, and I'm the director of the Global Energy Center at the Atlantic Council. Today's discussion will focus on the private sector's role in enabling the energy transition. Following COP26, there's renewed and heightened commitment by the global community to address the climate crisis. A foundational element to meeting the moment is leveraging the strength of the private sector and further empowering the clean energy marketplace. Global companies can both lead by example through their own operations while also shaping the market to pursue clean technologies. This shift is increasingly necessary and evident across the economy, but particularly so in the energy sector. Global energy companies such as Siemens Energy are central to this cause as they must simultaneously meet increasing global demand for energy while maintaining reliability and promoting the clean energy transition. So to have this conversation today, I'm delighted to welcome Tim Holt, member of the executive board and labor director for Siemens Energy, to discuss what's next following COP26 and the opportunities and challenges that lie ahead for the sector. Now, as a reminder, before we get started, you can submit questions through the Q&A and function on Zoom, uh, and we'll try to get to as many of these questions as we can during our discussion. So thank you all out there for joining us. And Tim, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Um, it's a real honor to, to finally meet you in person. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've talked over Zoom for, for a number of times. Um, and it's really fantastic that this conversation is happening right after the COP. I'm wondering if we could just start out with your take on Glasgow. Mm -hmm. Did the COP deliver what is necessary to drive the energy transition forward? Um, I think one important observation. So climate change has arrived and is on the uh, top of everybody's priority list. Um, I think the, the second key takeaway for me is it's time to act now. And uh, I think uh, COP26 President Alok Sharma has perfectly summed it up. The world has to move now from a decade of, uh, of uh, deliberation to a decade of delivery. And I think that's, that's really the, the key point. I think it's clear, the direction is clear. Now I think we have to talk about the speed how we get there right and we know um, you know how do we get to net zero but then what does it take to get there how do we act and I think it's there was a lot of discussion are we fast enough is this greenwashing I think it's all about now being positive about it and look at it and be focused on how do we get it done that's mm -hmm. my key takeaway mm -hmm. Now this is a big change from from Paris. Um, what the, the private sector was far more yeah. involved in this yeah. COP is really out front on this. How did this change come about? Where did this sense of urgency come from? Um, I think you know what what we have seen. I mean, since since Paris, more and more companies have now pledged uh, you know net zero goals. Mm -hmm. More governments, and right. I think it, there's momentum now. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know one of our major customers who doesn't have a net zero goal. And, and, and we're actually tracking it and it exponentially grown. So everybody is now talking, what do we do? And um, as I said, you know, now the discussion starts, how do we get it done? Uh, what are concrete projects? How do we start? Um, I mean, there's no silver bullet. Uh, you know, it's a series of technologies we need, a series of pilot projects mm -hmm. to get started. And I think that momentum also relates into we want to be involved. Yeah. We want to be in Glasgow. We want to be part of the discussion versus, you know, we just want to receive the results. Got it. Got it. Now, what is a global company like Siemens Energy? How does, how does a global company like Siemens Energy see multilateral cooperation yeah. on clean energy? Do we think of that this sort of a country by country level yeah. where you have, you know, projects in the U.S., projects in Germany, et cetera? Or, or do you see opportunity for cooperation internationally? I think both. I mean, it's, as you know, the, the world is a uh, diverse place. We have, you know, developing nations, you know, very heavily invested in coal generation. Um, you know, they have to catch up also on GDP growth. And I think the speed of change will be different than, for example, in the US, in Europe, and Germany. So I think it's important to A, have these tailored um, solutions, but then also look at where does it make sense to um, work you know, government to government, country to country. I think Europe, uh, European U Union is a good place because mm -hmm. I, I think it's, it's very obvious everybody's kind of on the same track, uh, has the same status. And um, I think what we really need that global cooperation is on technology. Mm -hmm. A lot of the technologies we look mm -hmm. at are early stage. I mean, hydrogen was, you know, top mm -hmm. of the agenda. 
CO2 air capture, another mm -hmm. big one, and it just requires everybody work together, the best research institute, governments, and, and technology providers. How do we make it happen, and how do we make it jointly happen? Mm -hmm. Where do you see technology going? What are you most excited about? Uh, uh, I think it's uh, storage, is particularly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, I'm long time history and uh, uh, Korea on the, on the power generation side. Uh, you know, worked on the, fo or actually I started out on the fossil side, you know, when I just out of school, I saw gas turbine, greatest technology, I'm going to retire and still work on gas turbines. <laughs> and, you know, the world has changed and, you know, wind came and uh, I worked for a while in our wind business, very exciting. Always thought, you know, PV, solar, it's too expensive, it's not going to come and, you know, prove them wrong. Is. So yeah. I think what I learned over the last uh, 25 years is really um, don't underestimate technology. Don't disregard technology because you feel, you know, the cost is still too high, it's not mature yet. I think we have proven over and over again that, you know, we, we can get it done. Technology is advancing much faster than we anticipate. And now it's, you know, take it to the next level. It's not so much on the renewable side, much more storage, uh, CO2 capture, and also grid technologies. I right. think those are the three kind of things I'm really excited about. Got it. Uh, I want to come back to grid technology, but, but first, um, you, you were talking about net zero commitments. Now, Siemens Energy is committed to climate neutrality by 2030. Mm -hmm. What do you need to do to make that happen internally? Yeah, I think, I mean, given the portfolio we have, you know, I probably would say internally is the easier part. I mean, I mean, you look at scope one, I mean, basically mm -hmm. the emission out of our factories, right. what we have, and that's, that's fairly easy. I mm -hmm. mean, it's not easy, but you know, you do the analysis, you know, you make the, um, the factories basically net zero, efforts are good. Then the scope two is really the uh, electricity consumption, uh, you know, the heating, the district heating, and a lot of countries we can, you know, buy green energy. Uh, and since we're a global company, I think in Europe, US, it's fairly easy. Right. Other, you know, other countries, it's a bit harder, that hit, hence the 2030. The part that's really hard is the scope three, right? Mm -hmm. What we buy and, you know, the products we produce. And that's where, where we're working on, on the portfolio, the shift away from, you know, the, the big gas turbine, you know, we announced last year, we're no longer on the, you know, uh, we got out of steam turbines for coal fire plants. Mm -hmm. So that's more the longer term gradual. So scope one, scope two, on own operation, I'm fairly positive. It's just a matter of availability in terms of you know buying green electricity. The other part is really more the strategy of the company and the portfolio Got shifts. Do you, see, do you see scope three by 2030? Is that part of the goal or is that further out? You yeah, think? I mean, I think when we look at it, um, currently we're about 30 billion annual revenue. Um, over 50% is already a net zero. That's the wind part, the transmission part. But we're dual rotating equipment. Uh, I mean, it's, it's based yeah. on burning fossil fuels. So, and, and that's, you know, if you have to replace 15 billion of revenue and shift it, it's, it doesn't happen overnight. Right. And that's, uh, you know, also our company strategy. When we say we want to um, be the leader in the energy transition, that's, that's really the main focus mm -hmm. of us on the mm -hmm. portfolio trans transition. So let's talk about your clients for a second. Uh -huh. So what partnerships and, and client type relationships do you need to have um, to, to accelerate net zero globally and particularly to get your clients to, to have net zero ambitions? Yeah. So um, I, I like what you said, you said partnerships, right? And, that, and normally you have a supplier, you know, customer right. relationship and you know, how, how do I get the cheapest price? You know, how, how's the competition? That has changed over the last years. And, and as you said, it's much more about these partnerships. How do we develop this jointly? Because in order to get there, it has gotten so complex. Uh, take hydrogen, for example. I mean, yeah, we have the electrolyzer, but you have to have you know, the, the green energy, the wind that comes in, there's a transmission piece, there's this you know, um, CO2 capture piece, and then what do you do with the hydrogen? That only works in partnerships. And also the clients understand it's not so much, you know, I buy a technology, I operate it. Um, I think we're jointly have to look at how do we deal with, you know, how do we work with local communities? How do we put different players in the industry together to put these um, uh, projects together? And I know it's an overused word, but how do you build that ecosystem? I mean, how do you come together and also be very transparent about the challenges and how to get it done? Mm -hmm. And a lot happens, you know, you start small with a prototype and then you go uh, much larger. Um, Maybe one example to cite is um, we're actually working on a project in, uh, in Chile. 
uh, Hauraoni. Um, it's in the south of Chile where we um, produce uh, hydrogen, mm -hmm. but also convert it into sin fuels. Right, uh, right. Partnership together with uh, Porsche, um, mm -hmm. together with Enel, um, you know, on, on the wind side. Um, but uh, we start with a pilot phase. So the first phase is uh, 130,000 uh, liters of sin fuel, mm -hmm. very little, and Porsche uses it on the test track. But phase two by 26, it's already 550 million uh, liters of uh, sin fuel, and it's enough to power 500,000 cars for one year. So, I mean, it, it it's shows real. you, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's real. And, uh, and this is just phase, phase, phase two, and then, you know, there's a plan to further scale it up. And what is the price on, on that sin fuel compared to a regular gasoline? I, I think uh, currently it's way above 10 euros a liter. Okay. So, you know, 12, yeah. 12 dollars. I mean, now, now I have to do the conversion into gallons and- uh, It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, it's multiples. a lot. And, I mean, you have to see what is the driver, and, and I think it's, it's also, you know, especially for the car industry who is kind of focused on the combustion engine, that's what they're good at. Right. Um, how do you keep that technology and how do you keep also the expertise and the jobs, you know, that, that are together with the combustion engine and then switch it to a alternative fuel? And I mean, we're going down the route of EVs, but I think Synfuel is also an alternative where maybe you know EV vehicles are not that uh, um, uh, suitable for the application. Got it. Um, well, since we're on vehicles, question: Do you think that Synfuels or hydrogen fuel cell is the way to go if you're talking passenger vehicles? Uh, that's uh, I, I, it's hard to make the prediction. I um, Maybe a bit of an anecdote, uh, you know, uh, Expo just opened in Dubai. Mm -hmm. I was actually at the Expo in Germany, Hanover. That was, uh, I believe, 2002. And uh, also hydrogen was on, on the agenda. Right. And there was a prediction by 2020, so last, last year. Last year. 50% of the uh, cars in Germany will be, you know, we'll powered by hydrogen. By hydrogen. Right. I think last year we had kind of 500, 500, <laughs> 500 vehicles. Are, yeah. So it, it shows you where the prediction goes. I think it, it's also cost benefit. I mean, it's you have to scale up the supply infrastructure. So I think it's there, there's other application of mobility that are a bit more promising, uh, be it on the, you know, on the trains. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, we're having discussion on mining, you know, these big mining trucks, right. you know, offsite, um, you know, also same there. The big mining companies ha have the net zero pledge, but they consume quite an amount of diesel on the mining, mm -hmm. plus on the, on the fuel for the ships. And for them, it's maybe a better alternative yeah. than going EV and, you know, these big trucks, you know, wheels, you know, twice our size with you know, batteries, it's, it's a bit harder. Right, absolutely. Now, we, we've been talking about hydrogen and you also mentioned gas turbines, so I wanna to go to a question mm. from the audience, from Bob Icord, and he's, he asks, um, Siemens is testing gas turbines that can use up to 75% hydrogen blend. Mm -hmm. So what's your expected timeline for deploying the turbines and is 100% hydrogen uh, a prospect? Um, let's start with that, uh, definitely. Um, we also have, and. An, as you know, we produce uh, gas turbines all sizes, you know, up to 400 megawatt all the way down to 10. It's actually a bit easier on the small application, which is good because they're used in refineries. Mm -hmm. uh, so there we're already doing tests on 100%. Okay. Um, on the large ones, we're currently at 30%, but with a clear roadmap to 100. And also there's a demand um, um, also from our customers. They make an investment decision now uh, to build a power plant permitting building five, six years down the road, and then they want to operate it for 20 years. So they're actually looking for, can I operate the plant on 100% hydrogen if I make the decision now? Right. So that's the discussion. We can have a, uh, we can have another discussion. It doesn't really make sense to put 100% hydrogen into a gas turbine. Basically, you take a electron, convert it into a molecule, convert it back into an electron. Um, but I think there, there will be applications where this is, uh, works out also mm -hmm. economically. Okay. What, what applications do you think those are? I, I think it's all about, I mean, I, I, the way we look at it is stranded assets. I mean, people have power plants. We need peaking power. I mean, we don't know where storage goes, but when we have really the storage both in, in terms of duration mm -hmm. and, and capacity. And I think it's a way, you know, there's a short, you know, cloud cover, there's a short dip in terms right. of uh, what's available from renewable sources. And then, you know, you fire up the gas turbines and run them on hydrogen. I think especially high power prices, it mm -hmm. works. Uh, but it's not going to be the baseload operation of power plants on hydrogen. 
unless we have a really, really big breakthrough in technology that I don't see currently. <laughs> right, right. Well, we can, we can hope for that. Um, okay, so uh, let's, let's go back to the, let's move away from hydrogen. It's yeah. very easy to go down yeah. that rabbit hole. I've done that many times. Um, so um, I want to talk more just about the, the role of companies. So, um, you know, carbon emissions is global, the interconnected challenges. So how, does, how do individual companies sort of think about this strategically? How do they tackle these issues that are outside of their direct purview? You know, we've mm -hmm. talked a little bit about scope three, but really beyond that, what can you help do as a company to help others yeah. uh, uh, outside your, your partners yeah. really encourage motion uh, towards net zero? Yeah, I mean, the way we look at it, I mean, there's, I mean, even if we talk scope three, kind of the back end, but there's also the procurement, uh, you know, mm -hmm. so green steel is a big one, right? If we created a demand and said, we only want to use green steel that's mm -hmm. produced, you know, without any CO2 emission, it creates an industry and it's a driver. I mean, at the end, you have to look at the whole value chain and said, do we get, I mean, if we use green steel, more, you know, higher cost, do we get paid by our customers for it? So I think there's a drive to, um, you know, upward on the procurement side, um, look at even transportation. Uh, I mean, we talked a bit about shipping, still using heavy fuel. I know there's, you know, uh, regulation coming that's, that's reducing emissions from shipping, but also making sure, you know, we put the right, um, uh, language in our contracts and, and drive the supply, ch supply chain to, to reduce emissions. The other one, and that's where we look beyond, is really um, a bit back to uh, hydrogen, but it's, it's a, a sector coupling. I mean, it's how do you use also um, hydrogen, electrify other industries to really reduce emissions. And uh, um, I mean, it's a lot of the industries um, chemical industry driven by fossil fuels, uh, electrification, you know, use renewable sources to drive uh, the motors. That's another way how we can really drive the industry and coming up with solutions that, that provide that, that pass. Got it. We have a really interesting question from the audience from uh, Stratos uh, Tavul. Ta, ta, I'm, I'm butchering your name. Tavul or ta, I'm going to give up. Um, he asks about uh, about risk and how a company like Siemens Energy manages risk during the energy transition, which is being driven by policy, yeah. which has a lot of technological innovation that's happening very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, lots of money is pouring, particularly after some of the new, new bills we've seen yeah. here uh, in the US, money pouring into new technologies. Um, how do you manage risk of, of investing in a technology, um, and Stavros uh, gives uh, the example of um, a certain type of storage, so yeah. that, that might be obsolete in five years yeah. because of the, um, the uh, ch technological changes, there's a, a breakthrough. Yeah. How do you manage, manage that yeah. when it's, it's if, if, if we are successful, this is a non-linear change. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of change that happens very quickly mm -hmm. and, and is in perhaps unpredictable. Yeah. I, I see it uh, two ways. I mean, one is to also, um, and you said it earlier, partnerships, right? I mean, it's not, in, in the past, we would have done our own R&D, said, hey, we have to develop it on our own. But there you run the risk, of course, you know, either you're hugely successful or, you know, you fail miserably. So for us, it's really looking at a portfolio of innovations and work with partnerships together mm -hmm. to actually, you know, have our, uh, you know, uh, be in different technologies and and we said we concentrate on on certain uh, field of actions where we said we want to look at how do we look at storage and the different storage technologies mm -hmm. um, how do we look at uh, you know zero emission uh, generation technologies how do we look at decarbonization of industrial processes so these are kind of the three major areas and then below that we have actually nine technology fields we look at and Probably not all of them are going to work out. So that's, that's one way how to look at risk. Um, the second one, and I think it's also um, not one to be underestimated, is um, the projects get much more complex. And it's not necessarily all in, in the past where we predominantly uh, provide a product, but you have large, complex uh, solutions uh, and projects multiple years. And same thing, partnerships, right? How you de-risk it. and. Um, briefly touched on, uh, on on transmission just seeing the number of HVDC projects that are mm -hmm. you know up on the drawing board right. right and I mean those are you know two three billion plus projects and you know the project business you know you do nine good projects and then you you know have one that goes terribly wrong and you you know you wipe out all the profit of the last nine ones so 
also there really the discipline and working with established partners, but also with our customers to de-risk it. We want to get all that infrastructure built out. We want to get it done, but we have to do it, you know, with the right kind of um, way how we distribute the risk among the players. Got it. Um, we talked at the beginning mm -hmm. uh, about how the private sector is really pushing ahead on uh, meeting the climate challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, so many companies are moving to net, making net zero pledges. What could derail this momentum? What could what could make this seem like a bad bet? Mm -hmm. What could make make companies re, um, uh, reverse these decisions, yeah. if anything? I think and and. I think we have seen it also in multiple countries. I think it's certainty on where we go. I mean, a good example is PTC, the production tax credits right, right. on wind in the in the U.S. And mm -hmm. it's it's up and down, right? You know, you extend them. You know, there's a rush, and then you, there's uncertainty, and the market goes down. You know, how as a company, how do you invest in R&D, in manufacturing, in you know, mm -hmm. in engineers, in in resources if you don't have a stable outlook? Or um, I think it happened in Spain, right? You know, the, the wind built out, there are certain subsidies for, uh, for production, and then retroactively they were canceled. So, and then, it, you know, all investment comes to a you know, dead stop. That for me, um, more the derailers that I mm -hmm. see. I think the, the direction um, going to, towards decarbonization, that's gonna happen. I think it's, you know, doing the step-by-step, -step, the, the two, three, year, three year increments and having that planning, uh, you know, certainty, to do the investments, to um, you know, hire the, the right level of expertise, to uh, to really develop the technologies, and the stop and go. That's that's really what could derail the the speed, not the you know, not the not the path, but more the speed. So the path is certain. Yeah. It's the the rate of change that yeah. we that we we really have yeah. to worry about. Mm -hmm. um, uh, speaking of rate of change, another good question from the audience from Vinette Sharma. Um, Will um, the inflationary pressure we see right now, the supply chain issues, if that, if that continues, could that slow down uh, the move to net zero? And, and both at Siemens Energy, um, but also more broadly in the, in the energy sector. No, no, definitely. And I mean, I, I would say I'm now spending a good amount of my time during the week on, on managing the supply chain issues. Yep. And I mean, we have seen it, uh, and it's, it's both you know, the cost of, of the raw material, its mm -hmm. availability of raw material, and its logistics. I mean, all that, all the three come together. Um, and if you look, take an offshore wind project, right? That, you know, the developer bids for a lease, you know, there's a certain uh, price per megawatt hour that he bids at, and then you have a certain assumption on the cost of developing the project, uh, and also what it costs for the equipment, the cable, and so on. Now, if you have double or triple the, the, the copper price, and you know, there's a huge amount of copper that goes mm -hmm. into the steel, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, these offshore platforms and so on, but the price is fixed for the next 20 years. So how do you, how do you manage the big increase in supply chain and at the end you run against a hard stop mm -hmm. because you cannot say, hey, you know what, I would like to get you know, double the, the dollars per megawatt hour right, for, right, right. for my offshore wind. <laughs> Not gonna happen. And I think that could really derail the industry. Um, and even so, I mean, if you look, these, these projects go multi-years. It's not easy to hedge. Um, so that's something we need to look at. And I think it's, it's here to stay. Mm -hmm. If you, uh, you know, just look at, you know, penetration of EV vehicles, mm -hmm. what does it do to copper price? Right. Build out of renewables. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's going to happen. Yeah. Even simple things. Um, you know, steel, uh, and give you an example, we do these on the transmission side, we do these breakers that have little springs. So it's a very minor part. But if you don't get the springs, you know, the, you know, the whole factory is at a standstill yeah. and, and you, incre you know, incur quite uh, significant costs. So, um, you know, getting a reliable supply chain is very key. And in the past years, you know, we worked, you know, also due to the, you know, cost out that we have seen, we worked on, you know, consolidating the supplier base, you mm -hmm. know, single source, there's only two. Um, also working on optimizing the factory networks, you know, feed up plants, everything, you know, do certain things in China that then come to other factories where you get it assembled. If the supply chain works perfectly, everything is good. Once, you know, something kind of trips up, it, it, yep. it kind of derails the whole system. Mm -hmm. And that's something that quite frankly, uh, to that extent, we 
hadn't seen coming and that we really need to look at and how do we address it going forward. Got it. Um, do, you, do you see some of the, the rise in prices of the, the transition minerals and metals like yeah. copper or lithium yeah. as separate issues from the, the current supply chain bottlenecks and inflation? Um, it, I think that has always happened, and I think it's a, um, I think two factors. One is how much supply is there. I think the other one is really where is that supply coming from? Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of these materials come either from, uh, you know, if you look at it, the countries are not that political stable, so it's much more availability mm -hmm. versus what it costs. And, I mean, we have seen, um, you know, a couple of years back, rare earths where China said, mm -hmm. we're going to stop exporting, and, you know, a huge spike. Mm -hmm goes into the wind turbines, you know, into the magnets. What do right. we do now? Right. And, I, and I think that's, that's always a concern. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's a wider industry concern that we need to address. Right. And, uh, you know, th there's more coming online, more, uh, you know, uh, also a bit more out of a, um, in terms of countries, more stable. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's something to watch and that we also have in our, you know, enterprise risk management. We regularly look at it and, and it, it's on the radar. So do you see this as a potential area of geopolitical risk to the energy transition? Definitely, definitely. And it's, I mean, it, it's not just in the, in the supply of raw materials. Sometimes, I mean, we have seen it in the past, you know, the China-U.S. Uh, trade relationship. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have a global, if you have a global supply chain and an integrated supply chain, um, that's really an area of concern because you want to make sure that the trade treaties work, that, you know, there is a certainty also on that side uh, that you can, you know, really operate that global supply chain. Got it. Pivoting to a totally different topic, but a really good question. We have a few minutes left. This one's coming from Nicole de Tom, uh, who asks, do you think Siemens has recruited the right people? to deliver the company's transition targets? So labor question, yeah. um, as, as your yeah. job is uh, at um, Siemens. I, I think it's, it's actually not only recruiting the right people, but also how do we transition our existing employee base? You know, so, you know, we got about 90, uh, 92,000 employees, uh, you know, and yeah. if you look, um, I would say probably 50% work in the traditional, you know, fossil business, you know, gas turbines, steam turbines. So, how do we bring them along uh, and, and you know, re-educate them? So that's, that's one area. The other one on hiring, I think we also see the switch. I mean, in the past, very much mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, mm -hmm. know much more a, you know, all of a sudden also with hydrogen and where this goes, you need much more, um, you know, chemists, you know. You know, you, you start, you know, concentrating on the molecules right. versus, you know, on the electrons and, you know, that, that we had before. So. Also, they're ramping up, and it's something um, where we, over the last year, year and a half, put a lot of work on the strategic workforce planning. We actually have um, certain profiles. What do we need for storage? What's kind of the, how, how does a R&D department for storage look like? What are the skill set? Where do we find that? And I, I think it's um, especially in, if you look at the US and, and also Europe, of course, we got quite, uh, if you look at the competition, competition for, for labor. It's the Googles, it's the Apples also. So, I mean, Siemens Energy is maybe not as sexy as an employer. I mean, even so we're in the energy transition. I, I think so. Yeah. But how, how do you get that talent and where do you find it globally to really make sure you have the right people and to really drive that energy transition? Got it. Um, we're running out of time. Just want to give you an opportunity to make any final, final remarks or any final thoughts on, yeah. on this conversation yeah. and really about how Siemens Energy is driving forward yeah. to net zero. Um, I think for me, very important is, and I said it at the beginning, it's, uh, I think the direction is clear. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, it's all about now the speed of implementation and how do we get together also in these partnerships, you know, be it governments, be it, you know, um, um, energy players, be it the communities. It, it isn't enough to just set more, you know, raise the, the goalposts and say, we don't want to get there earlier. You have to get there. And as you know, energy is one of the most capital intensive industries. Project take, projects take five, six, seven, up to 10 years. So, I mean, if we start now, we'll get there in, you know, at the second half of this decade. So we better get moving and we better do it jointly versus, you know, uh, trying to argue with each other. 
Tim, thank you so much. Um, I, I take that uh, as a direct command for the Atlanta Council, but everyone in the audience, we better get moving. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, and you guys are doing fantastic work at Siemens Energy. So thank you so much for being here today. Uh, and again, a real pleasure to meet you in person. Um, thank you uh, out, in, out in the audience uh, for joining us today. Um, a really fantastic conversation. Um, thanks again for just following the Atlanta Council. Now, if you're interested in advanced technologies, and I'm talking very advanced technologies, um, um, at 2.30 Eastern, so uh, in just uh, about two hours, uh, we're going to have a conversation on the future of fusion energy in the United States. So that's going to be really, really interesting. Um, and again, they better get moving because uh, we need that. So until next time, thank you so much um, and ho hope you have a great rest of your day and a great weekend.